The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome. Um, adult confirmation begins this morning in between services. Uh, uh, members are always welcome, and of course, non-members as well. Sixth, seventh, eighth grade confirmation begins Wednesday at 3.15. And thanks to all those who helped with sandwiches on the park. Um, you brought a lot of smiles and filled a lot of tummies, and we're grateful for your work. Order of service today is uh, a service of prayer and preaching, opening hymn, Lamb of God. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Sanctify us in your truth. Your word is true. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
The Old Testament reading is from Ezekiel chapter 34. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep and will seek them out, as a shepherd seeks out his flock. When he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered, on a day of clouds and thick darkness, and I will bring them out from the peoples, and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines, and in the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and male goats, is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet the rest of your pasture and to drink of clear water? That you must muddy the rest of the water with your feet and must my sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet and drink what you have muddied with your feet? Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep because you push with side and shoulder and thrust at all the weak with your horns till you have scattered them abroad. I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be prey. And I will judge between sheep and sheep, and I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David. And he shall feed them, and he shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them, I am the Lord, I have spoken. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from 1 Timothy chapter 1. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and with the grace of our Lord overflowed for me, with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 15th chapter. Glory to you. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. And he said there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, 
but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and draw near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry, refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. The Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to you. Please turn to page 322. Page 322. Second article of the Creed in the right-hand column. Together, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. And we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Sermon text is the gospel lesson. When we need to give Toby, the dog, a pill, we don't give it to him unconcealed. He'll just gag it out onto the floor and look at us as if we've lost our minds. Instead, we'll tuck the pill into a piece of sausage and present it to him as if he were the best doggy in Wisconsin, which he is. He receives it happily and asks if he might have another. Similarly, this coming Wednesday, 6th, 7th, 8th grade confirmation begins. With the 6th grade class especially, we don't just start teaching raw Christian doctrine. They would gag it out and spit it out. And, um, and so in 6th in grade, we start especially by telling them the stories. More specifically, uh, Ron Willie retells many of the biblical stories in the Bible. And in so doing, he teaches doctrine without them even really knowing that he's doing that. He tucks that pill into a wonderful piece of sausage. We do that because Jesus did it all the time. Rarely did he speak anything in long, formal discourses. No, he used parables, captivating his his listeners, but along the way, teaching them the truths of God. Matthew 13, all these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. Today, in the parable of the prodigal son, there's a lot of doctrine packed into it. This isn't a parable that makes just one point. It makes many. It speaks of the nature of sin and how it separates us from God and how it wrecks our lives It speaks of repentance and how that is a a turning away from sin, coming back to the Father. It speaks of unconditional love and his forgiveness and how there is joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. It speaks of how the Father must also rescue those who appear obedient and responsible on the surface but are just as lost and separated from God by their sin. Jesus packs a lot of doctrine into this little parable. We can think of this parable as a three-part play. Part one gives us the younger brother, the prodigal. Dad, I cannot wait for you to die. You're still strong and sprightly after all, and by the time you kick the bucket, I won't be young and vital enough to really enjoy the inheritance. So how about it? How about you give me my share today? And remarkably, the father does. He gives him his half of the inheritance. The young man takes off for the far country. Every age has its own peculiar far country, and so does ours. Every person has his, her own peculiar far country, and so do you. It's some fantasy that draws you away, pulls you away from the father. What's your far country? The lad takes his inheritance and runs off to his far country where he takes a long, voluptuous holiday. The text says he squanders his property in reckless living. I like the old translation, riotous living. Whatever else reckless and riotous living is, it's living only for the moment, which sounds so sexy and courageous even, commendable in our, in our age. Until the economy tanks and there's a famine, then those living only for the moment people are the very first to feel the pain and they feel it the longest and the deepest and the loudest as well. That's what befalls this young man. The inheritance is spent. He's been evicted. His stuff has been unceremoniously thrown into a pile by the curb where it sits derelict in the rain. Within days, he's so broke and hungry that he'll do anything for food. 
He had run to the far country in part to find himself. Now he finds himself feeding pigs. His new four-legged companions are unclean in every way and not nearly as attractive as the two-legged companions who hung around him while he was living in the moment. But those friends are gone now. They have their own troubles. They don't need to listen to his whining. So now it's just pigs. Everywhere pigs. Who also only hang around him so long as he has pig food in his pail. The boy is on the front edge of starvation. The scraps in his pail are starting to look like a Sunday buffet. That's when it dawns on him. I will go back to my father and hope for the best. That's part two. I'm sorry, that's part one. Part two is about the father. He loves his boys, both of them, and sometimes he just doesn't like them much. They stir up his anger like few others can and make make him wonder where he went wrong. However, both of them are his sons, and so he's bound to them inextricably. He could no more stop himself from loving them than he could stop the sun from shining. Moms and dads, grandpas and grandpas, you know about this. You cannot help but love them, even though you may not like them much of the time. In the same way, have you ever considered the possibility that God may not like you much? Have you ever considered the possibility that you provoke your father and stir up his anger because of the things you do and think and say? And though he is with you all the time, have you ever considered there may be times he doesn't enjoy being with you? Could it be he loves us not because we're so lovable, but because he's our father and he's bound to us inextricably? Someone said home is is the one place where when you arrive they have to let you in. But this father actually does something more for his prodigal than just open the door. This father runs to his son. I love that image. The text says, while his son was still a long way off, his father saw him and ran. Of course, he had lots of reasons to run from his son, but he's running to him. Picture him doing that, won't you? Picture him running down the the lane as fast as his old legs will carry him, robes flying high behind him. These days, we even see old men running for exercise. In the ancient world, distinguished old men never ran for anyone or anything. That's what servants were for. But when he sees his son running to him was the only possible thing this father could do. It's an involuntary response. Quote, he had compassion on him and embraced him and kissed him. He lavishes love on his son and then orders the servants to bring gifts for him and orders them to prepare the fattened calf. He does this all very publicly, sending the signal to the servants and whoever else might be watching this that this one, this Wretched, reprehensible young man who smells faintly of pigs, he's still my son. That's part two. Part three is about the older brother, and he sounds to me a lot like a conservative Lutheran. We find him out in the field working. All along he's been doing that, tending the estate, keeping the farm afloat. When the younger brother took a long holiday from responsibility, the older brother absorbed the extra work into his own. When the younger brother kept making poor decisions, the older brother kept making good decisions. So when he notices all the fuss his father is making over his younger brother, he gets a complicated mix of emotions going on. There's a good dose of self-righteousness in there anger, sadness, jealousy. See yourself in this older brother. 
This poisonous cocktail of emotions crowds out any other potential feelings for compassion or mercy. He's so concerned about personal responsibility and accountability that there's no room, no room at all for grace or compassion in his worldview. In fact, he is angry at his father for having compassion and grace, so he refuses to go in the house. And in doing so, he too has separated himself, excluded himself from the father's presence. When the father notices his older son hasn't yet come in, he has to go out and bring him in, just as he did the younger. The father has to retrieve the older one too. We simply must celebrate, he tells him, for your brother was dead, good as dead. He's now alive. He was lost and is found. That's part three. Now, a few, part, a few thoughts about this parable, no particular order. First this, no one is too far gone. No one is so lost, so wicked, that he or she is beyond the reach of the father. This father can run to and forgive and restore anyone, anywhere, if they'll let him. And no one is so good, so dutiful, so responsible, so full of integrity that he doesn't need the Father. Sometimes our sense of having been good, our sense of, of pride and honor and integrity even build walls between us and God. Said another way, if you think your sin is small potatoes compared to the prodigals of this world, then you have a dinky little Savior. Notice also how quick the father was to forgive. The prodigal had been planning to say more in terms of his confession, right? But he was never able to finish his little speech because the father is already barking out orders, not to his son, but to his servants. Quick, bring the best robe, put it on and put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, prepare the fattened calf. How our God loves to forgive. How our God loves to forgive. That can be a hard one for us. We can get our minds around this notion of forgiveness so long as we know there's been proper remorse and, and, and repentance and, and heartfelt, I'm so sorry. But this seems different. This is a reckless, forgiving love that runs to the loss. This is a forgiveness that doesn't wait for the full apology, nor did the father make the prodigal go through the whole litany of sin. When, God's, when God forgives, he forgives us fast, and of far more than we'll ever be able to recall or confess. Do you remember what sparked this parable in the first place? The Pharisees were grumbling because Jesus was attracting to himself a whole bunch of sinners. They even call them friend of sinners. And with this parable, Jesus is in effect saying, for once, for once, you've got it right. That's who I am. I am friend of sinners. And that's why I've come to forgive and restore and save sinners. Sometimes we're more like the prodigals, having spent ourselves in sin and now having nowhere else, no one else to turn to, we come home to the Father. How good it is to know that in spite of everything, the Father still loves us. Sometimes we're more like the older brother, hardworking, reliable, disciplined, smug, self-righteous, incapable of compassion. How good it is to know the Father still loves us in spite of everything. See how these parables teach us doctrine. See how a pill can taste good to a dog when it's tucked into a piece of sausage. One last thing. In the religion of the Pharisees, there is no running father who embraces and restores his son. That's not how it worked. In ancient Judaism, sinners were shunned and disowned. The village elders would have had a ceremony of shame known in Hebrew as kazaza. They would have taken a clay pitcher and thrown it down in front of the prodigal, smashing it 
and, and as thereby showing that his ties with the community were ruined, were, were broken, and he is no longer welcome. But in running to meet his son, the father gets to the son with the gospel before they get to him with the law. So there's no running father in the religion of the Pharisees. And there's no running father in the religion of Islam. Islam teaches having mercy on a sinner means you don't have to punish him to the full extent of the law. That's not the same, is it? That's not the same as the father running down the lane to forgive. Yet today in some Muslim cultures, women who commit adultery or who refuse to marry the husband arranged for them or even women who were sexually assaulted are seen as having brought great shame and dishonor on their families. Severe punishment is called for. Many women are brutally beaten, disowned, or disfigured with acid attacks by their own family members, male family members. In 2010, police in the United Kingdom alone recorded 2,823 such honor crimes. Even worse, those honor crimes often turn into honor killings. In 2000, every year, the United uh, Nations estimates there are about 5,000 of those every year, done by a male family member, again, beating, stoning, cutting the throat, beheading, strangling, all for the sake of saving face and restoring the family's honor. Father in the parable isn't concerned about saving face, is he? He's concerned about saving his son. The father in the parable restores honor by running and forgiving, not by strangling. There's no running father in the religion of Islam. And you won't find the running father in the religions of Buddhism or Confucianism or Hinduism. We can't go into it all, but he's not there to be found. You won't find the running father in any of the other religions of the world. He belongs only to this parable told by Jesus, God's son. If you need a God who loves you and forgives you in spite of everything, you will find him only in Jesus. If you need God to run to you, like a father with robes flying high to embrace and forgive and restore you publicly as the heir. If you need a God who even celebrates and laughs and finds joy in your repentance, your restoration, your homecoming, you will find him only in Jesus. He's the one who runs down the lane He's the one who meets us where we are. He's the one who blesses us with love and compassion and mercy. He's friend of sinners. He's the one who has opened his house to you and has prepared and regularly prepares the best possible food for you. There is none other. Our God runs. Amen. Peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
In our prayers, we celebrate with Heather Drake and, and David Steinhardt, who were married uh, yesterday afternoon. We pray for the sick, for Francis Vins, Del Boyer, Mary Reichert, Karen Karatz, Chris Lungstrom, Jerry Brandemuel, Sarah Schaefer, uh, Phyllis Zaumer, um, uh, for um, Aaron's father, Dale. Daniel, Daniel Astrike, who is, is very ill. For my wife, please, as well, who is taking a, a vacation from chemo and is starting up a, a treatment of radiation this week. Please stand for prayer. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon, with all our heart, with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Christian Church here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and the dying, and for those who care for them. For those we've named, those whom we name in our hearts. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our nation, as it remembers the 15th anniversary. For those who are grieving this day. For the survivors. For the firemen and, and police uh, across the nation, for all who are in the business of uh, stopping terrorism where it happens. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those of us who are like prodigals or who love family members who are prodigals, for those of us who are like the older brothers, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the ability to show love and forgiveness as you show us love and forgiveness, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Finally, for these and for all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you are the good shepherd without whom nothing is secure. Rescue and preserve us that we may not be lost forever, but follow you, rejoicing in the way that leads to eternal life. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you've caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them read, mark, learn, take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. <laughs>
Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen.